Today I'm hosting Marta Martinelli, a Senior Director of Programs at the Center for Civilians in Conflict. And today we talk a lot about the geopolitical aspects of the war in Ukraine. We discuss whether we are living in a new Cold War situation, and we try to guess how long will this war last. But we talk little about the true cost of this, and for that matter, of all other wars of today. And to discuss about this topic, uh, about the protection of civilians in wars, we have as our guest today, Marta Martinelli. Marta Martinelli is Senior Director of Programs at the Center for Civilians in Conflict. Previously, she held several positions at the Open Society European Policy Institute, focusing her advocacy on the Global South, peace and security, gender and democracy. Through her fieldwork experience, Marta has facilitated dialogue between civil society and institutions with a particular focus on security sector reform and democratic oversight of security policies and practices. Marta has provided expert advice to international organizations including the EU Commission and UNDP, as well as expert hearings at the European Parliament, the UN Security Council and the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She has worked for several years as a member of the Task Force on Peace Building in the Great Lakes region. Welcome to the White House podcast, Mark. Thank you, Surjan, and thank you for offering me this time and space. Today, one quarter of the world's population lives in a conflict zone. We have the highest number of violent conflicts since 1945, if I'm not mistaken. And it's estimated that approximately 50 million civilians are currently bearing the brunt of warfare. And having this in mind, I would like to start uh, our conversation with perhaps the um, hardest but most important question. Uh, what actions can be taken to prevent and mitigate the civilian losses of wars? Thank you for the question, uh, Surgeon, and and also let me thank you for uh, bringing back the attention to the core issue of protection of civilians, uh, which is also part of the uh, narrative and discourse that we should have when we reflect about conflict. Civilian stories are often uh, neglected or are only used in the media to actually portray gruesome details, for example, of the violence and abuse uh, that goes on in war but they're less uh, related and documented to um, uh, reflect on how they cope uh, with violence and war and what their needs are. Often we expect the humanitarian community to do that, um, but then we uh, uh, lose the opportunity to reflect on how this relates on the conduct of states and security uh, agencies. So when they are, you ask me uh, what governments can do um, to uh, what what we can do to minimize harm on civilians and to prevent uh, civilian losses, we need to first of all accept that providing assistance, which has been a large part of the approach in in the past, is um, regarded as uh, insufficient. And so, as war continues, the way that we address civilian protection needs also needs to uh, to evolve. But the measures that we take uh, also depend on those actors that are the so-called duty bearers of protection, those that have the primary responsibility to protect civilians. And those are clearly identify in, identified in international humanitarian law as being states and their agencies. It is only when um, states um, massively fail to provide um, protection that we recur to international forces. And, and you will not forget that the, the years 2000, you know, uh, and later we are very uh, um, uh, rise with debate about their responsibility to protect, uh, etc. right? So uh, interventions can take place at national, regional and uh, international level. What I was saying earlier on is that uh, international humanitarian law defines the obligations uh, for uh, protecting civilians and spare civilians and civilian objects 
from the effects of military uh, operation. Uh, and that means that combatants must take all feasible precautions to avoid uh, incidental harm uh, to civilians. They must also distinguish between civilians and combatants, and they must facilitate the provision of humanitarian assistance. So in practice, what does that mean? How can we, as you mentioned, prevent and mitigate civilian losses? It means that um, we cl create protected areas, uh, we create no safe, no fly zones, sorry, safe uh, evacuation corridors. Uh, when we do evacuations, we set them up in a way that they are meant to be only temporary. When we look at the infrastructure that provides for evacuation, we prepare so that where civilians need to shelter, uh, it is as comfortable as possible, and we prepare for unpredictable length of stay in such sheltering uh, condition. But there are other things that we can do. Establishing uh, good, well, uh, reliable uh, communication systems between uh, the agencies and the institutions and the actors that are involved in protection and communities is fundamental because the protection needs of civilians evolve as the uh, conflict and the fighting uh, evolve and um, having good, reliable communication with civilians also allow us to have more effective uh, responses and more uh, more context specific uh, responses. Then there are other things: public advocacy, for example. Um, you know, often local communities find it difficult to raise uh, what they have detected as being early warning signs of attacks that are coming. Right. Uh, maintaining the mobilization of the civil society, both local, regional, and international, is essential because um, it raises the political costs of aggression to civilians. Um, and finally, uh, when we see that the targeting of civilians is part of the strategy and the tactics of uh, belligerents, and in fact becomes even we could say one of the aims uh, of belligerence, then there is a particular responsibility to uh, and value placed on the effective use of all diplomatic tools to uh, encourage um, uh, uh, conversations and dialogues that have protection at the heart of them, uh, that, as I said, are conducive to create uh, safe corridors, for example, to create uh, moments of suspensions of hostilities, etc. So the dialogue is, is, is also very important. Until now, I have reflected on the role of states and their agencies. I have explained that those are the primary duty bearers of protection. But there is also an awful lot of agency in the population itself. And we need to understand what the uh, communications, interconnections uh, are the preferences of the populations are. This is very important for preparing and planning. For example, we need to understand what behavior are they likely to display? Are they likely to flee or are they likely to, to stay? Uh, and what actions are they likely to take to mitigate harm to themselves? Um, are they going to choose subterranean shelters, for example, or are they going to choose abandoned buildings uh, and, and remain to, with a certain level of uh, vulnerability? They might take actions, civilians, like um, repairing roads or digging ditches at night that might be uh, interpreted as hostile. So understanding the uh, attitude of, of civilians in a highly unpredictable environment is very important to prepare adequately and increase the, the chances of, uh, of protection. Uh, what can the states and governments do to empower civilians, as you were saying, uh, to protect themselves? Yes, so I have um, indicated uh, a, a few things, but one of the things, uh, certainly one of the things that they can do, as I mentioned earlier on, the importance of the... Um, uh, communication between governments and institutions, which include local institutions and which includes forces that are operational in any given theater, is very important. Legitimizing civilian voices, not only when they express needs, 
But for example, also when they raise early warning signals of attacks, you know, showing that this um, intelligence, if you wish, provided by civilian is taken into account, showing that uh, we are helping uh, them be part of the response that is provided to protect them. There are other things that governments can do. Civilians often know where and how, you know, they can reconvene with their families in case of dispersions. They also know on what infrastructure they are relying in terms of electricity, sanitation, water. They can indicate what uh, in, uh, parts of those infrastructures are particularly important to them and to their protection. And so... Um, uh, ensuring that, that that is a primary concern and is primarily addressed is, is very important. Other things that governments can do is helping them identify uh, safe escape routes uh, because in most cases, what civilians choose to do in case of attacks is in fact um, fleeing. Uh, other things that they can do is separate the IT infrastructure that is necessary for civilian protection and, and protect that infrastructure. For example, uh, the, the infrastructure that relates to uh, health provision and health services. Um, and other things um, that we've been told, you know, clear demarcation to know when the kids are safe going out and play, for example. So cl clearly demarcating areas uh, that should be off limits, um, having a clear communication on what are the sound signals that civilians might, might hear and what they uh, mean uh, for their protection. Um, and then providing the means, uh, for example, for organizations and individuals as well that are tracking harm uh, on civilians, uh, including with um, technical capabilities, providing opportunities for uh, satellite uh, communication, for example, uh, and validating the reports and uh, the findings of civilians. These are all uh, measures that can be put in place for um, uh, civilians themselves uh, to, feel, uh, to feel empowered. In your previous career, uh, your main area of focus uh, was always on Africa. You have experience of living and working in countries such as the Democratic Republic of Congo. So can you tell us something about your work there in terms of, you know, the biggest challenges in protecting civilians in conflict? Yes. And... Um... Maybe we'll have an occasion uh, also during our conversation again to, uh, you know, I think that a lot of the uh, current attention is uh, absorbed by uh, the Ukrainian conflict. We have plenty of forgotten conflict and tragedies and plenty, thousands of civilians that are exposed to conflicts worldwide. So when we talk, for example, to uh, the African space, uh, the main sources of harm to civilians, they come, are, are two. And those are the uh, armed non-state actors, uh, including those that fight in opposition to states, and uh, like the M23, for example, in, in Congo, ISWAP in Nigeria, uh, Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia, the TPLF in Ethiopia. So we have plenty of examples like this. And some of these armed non-state groups have, um, um, uh, they want to govern locally, so they have ambition to um, uh, be part of local governance, if you, if you wish. Others extort uh, or do inflict violence against civilians in exchange for taxation. I mean, and often these motivations um, intermingle. The second source of harm to civilians uh, are governments themselves and security uh, forces that are a uh, key perpetrator of harms to, to civilians. As we saw during uh, the brutal uh, government's reaction to in the Ethiopian uh, conflict, where both sides uh, you know, perpetrated large-scale harm to, to civilians, uh, sometimes we also see that the harm is unintentional due to inadequate 
planning or execution of operations. And that's why earlier on I was saying to you that part of what governments can do to um, empower civilian is is to establish very good uh, communication points between institutions, uh, uh, security forces and civilians. So one uh, of our teams has recently shared a story uh, that encapsulates the choices that civilians in this context do, and it relates specifically to Lake Chad, but it can be extrapolated to uh, other situations. So you need to imagine that there is a civilian uh, farmer grazing goats um, uh, or, or, or farming, and he hears that there is an impending attack on uh, its village. And this person has four choices. They can run back to their village and take up arms to save their families, but they risk retribution attacks by armed groups. They can gather their family and run away, uh, self-displace, and risk attacks by other groups that are also present in the same area. Uh, they can also go and find government forces uh, and uh, warn them. But then again, in doing so, they risk being exposed to uh, attacks by uh, armed uh, non-state groups. And finally, they can also tolerate to leave with the armed group and leave under their violent uh, imposition of, of their will. Uh, this is a scenario that we hear repeated in several situations where we operate in conflicts. And what happens is that civilians always make the best choice available to them for their own protection in that uh, given uh, context. And we must keep that in mind uh, when we can, what we can do uh, when we uh, want to help. In conflict, in, in Africa, sorry, uh, conflicts are mostly asymmetric conflicts. Um, and this uh, make uh, distinguishing between uh, civilians and combatants uh, very difficult. Um, and uh, often civilians are um, uh, suspected of being part or provided support uh, to, uh, to armed opposition groups. Um, and what we encourage governments to do is to assume that civilians are civilians unless proven uh, otherwise. otherwise. And in this context, the primary responsibility for protection rests with the, uh, with the government. Um, it's important to understand this because most militaries remain very enemy-centric uh, in the way they plan and, and conduct uh, operations. So what CIVIC does, which is the organization uh, that I'm part of, what we do is um, we deploy a wide range of training and uh, advisory tools. For example, uh, we have helped the G5 uh, uh, joint force in the Sahel and Amazon um, develop a tool to track uh, analyze and respond for uh, respond to civilian harm resulting from their operations of presence. This is um, an important tool that is uh, completely internal to the militaries that helps them identify uh, patterns of civilian arms or in case of uh, abuses also prepared and, and, and respond. Very I mean, just for our public, uh, can you explain, can you just contextualize a bit uh, the Sahel conflict, uh, which are the belligerent parties and with which governments are you working with? In the Sahel, we're working in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Niger, and um, Sahel is defined differently by different actors, but also in the northern part of uh, Nigeria, um, and there is, a, um, uh, I would say, a conflation uh, of, uh, of, of reasons that are at the sources of the instability of the Sahel. Uh, some of them have got to do with uh, territorial claims and um, uh, opposition to a certain state. Uh, we have also witnessed recently two cases of coup d'etat, so uh, violent uh, changes of power um, in, in the Sahel. Uh, 
um, there is uh, a, a large, uh, the Sahel is a corridor for large population movements. Uh, so that is a region in, in Africa where several uh, causes of conflict uh, come together uh, to create very unstable uh, situations from, for populations that, uh, that flee and are subject also, uh, for example, to terrorist attacks as we see uh, in, in, uh, in the north of, of Nigeria. Thanks a lot for shedding the light of this other parallel conflicts to the actual to the war in Ukraine but uh, 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 but with all I wanted to ask you because most Western eyes uh, remain on the war in Ukraine and uh, uh, what is the significance of this war uh, and what and what are the consequences that it's likely to have for the protection of civilians internationally? The Ukraine conflict on many aspects, the Ukraine war on many aspects compares to uh, to other conflicts, but there are some significant differences um, that do does do affect. Sorry, the the space, uh, the, the the field of POC internationally. So the first one is that. Uh, in Ukraine, what we're seeing is a deliberate uh, targeting of civilians and of civilians' uh, infrastructure, which is definitely a defining character of this war. This is not to say that it hasn't happened elsewhere. And really, I can think of you know one horrific example. For example, just to name um, Sudan uh, in the early 2000s, they were painting uh, their plays with UN colors to conduct air raids, uh, you know. So when we talk about total disregard for civilians, this is not the first time that it happens. But in, with regard to Ukraine, probably what makes the difference is the intensity uh, of the operations, the scale of the operations, and also the fact that the affected territory is, you know, that there are multiple affected areas in the territory of, of Ukraine. Um, most incidents to civilian arms are also related to operations in densely populated area because uh, Ukraine is characterized, uh, you know, also by a, 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 a dense uh, urban environment. This is not to say that other countries have not experienced urban warfare. We have example, uh, examples from Somalia, from Yemen, obviously from, from Iraq. We have several examples, but uh, in Kharkiv, Mariupol, and Kiev uh, have been the object of multiple uh, launch rocket systems that have also been prohibited in Ukraine since uh, 2018. Um, and there's been a range of attacks on hospitals, maternity wards, as you know, uh, psychological clinics, um, uh, water facilities, etc. I think one of the international consequences is uh, certainly that um, there's been no effort to spare civilians. Uh, the attacks have been, you know, um, no effort to avoid disproportionate and indiscriminate uh, harm. Um, and uh, international law in this regard has been, uh, you know, completely uh, flaunted. The, International Investigative Commission uh, of Inquiry uh, on Ukraine has found that there are many cases of, of civilians harm that has been deliberate uh, and intentional. When it comes to civilian casualties, how does the war in Ukraine compare to others? And um, I can give you a few numbers and then also a, a bit of reflection on how this war compared to others. Um, in Ukraine, we have um, more, uh, or nearly 6 million of uh, IDPs and uh, so internally displaced people and 8 million people have actually fled to European countries. 40% of the Ukrainian population is in need of humanitarian assistance according to uh, OCHA. And as of December 31st uh, in 2022, um, more uh, than 760 attacks were conducted against healthcare facilities, uh, vehicles, and personnel, as recorded by uh, the WHO. But the war on Ukraine has also have um, 
an environmental uh, cost. It results in environmental uh, degradation due to the toxic uh, debris that the uh, war is living around and in affects, affecting a large part of the territory. Coal mines are being flooded because the uh, electricity that allows uh, underground uh, pipes to work is, is being targeted. This has impact also for food security and distribution, the ability to stock, for example, food. Um, and all this has been uh, degraded. Um, and environmental degradation is going to have an impact on civilians for years to come, even if the war was to end today. One last word, maybe, uh, that is also prominent with regard to the Ukraine conflict is that... Um, the new challenges that the use of artificial intelligence and cyber tools uh, pose. Why? Because by using cyber, um, we can effectively accelerate the pace of operations. That means that we will um, see, uh, you know, um, operations being conducted simultaneously in large part of the territory. In response, we need to to do more delegation of decision-making power. And that not just across the ranks of security forces, but also we'll see more and more non-human decision-making capabilities being deployed. The, the growth of cyber also expands uh, the range of uh, vulnerability because it really affects, it can really affect the services that are delivered to uh, the population leading to death and, and, and physical harm. So cyber resiliency is a very important part of delivery, uh, more effective protection uh, outcomes for civilians. One way, for example, being that we need to segregate computer systems uh, on which essential civilian infrastructure uh, relies. The war in Ukraine is, is sort of landed really like a landmine in the middle of the UN Security, Co um, Security Council. And um, we had seen a couple of decades where uh, the UN Security Council was very much seized of the issue of, of POC, protection of civilians, particularly in relation, of course, to the mandates and, and uh, um, operations of peacekeeping uh, missions. Um, but the situation in Ukraine is now creating a bit of a backlash in this uh, sort of uh, uh, shared understanding to a certain extent that uh, that was present in the UN Security Council. Maybe to come back, uh, you were talking about the actual protection of civilians and the civilian deliberate targeting of civilian areas in Ukraine. And uh, I want to uh, maybe uh, draw you uh, talk about uh, Last year's controversy in August uh, 4, 2022, press release uh, at that time, six months into the war, Amnesty International accused practically Ukraine of endangering civilians by creating army bases in residential areas. And this obviously provoked an outrage amongst Ukrainian civil society and officials saying that Amnesty was responsible of... Uh, uh, shifting the quote to the responsibility from the aggressor Russia to the victim. And the head of Amnesty's Ukraine office uh, resigned over this controversy, saying her team had not been properly consulted over the report. Mm, that, uh, in her view, and again I quote, uh, sounded like support for the Russian narratives. Can, can you maybe explain to our viewers this controversy and what happened? Yes, I think the biggest controversy was due to the fact that Amnesty issued a report that um, reflected on the activities of the Ukrainian uh, armed forces, um, probably a bit out of context. Uh, maybe we'll have an occasion to talk about the uh, you know the the current uh, the, the, the some of the characteristics of uh, current conflicts, which includes, as I mentioned earlier on, you know the urban aspect. Now, in in urban contexts uh, and in urban areas, all uh, sides are likely to end up um, 
you know, uh, doing something which may uh, eventually impact uh, civilians or uh, put them at risk. But uh, highlighting, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, in urban areas, it's very difficult to distinguish civilian from non-civilian in infrastructure. Militaries and defense forces might have to be installed um, in urban areas, etc. Uh, uh, so when there is a lot of confusion when war is fought in, in, in urban areas. But highlighting the wrongdoings of uh, one actor... Uh, uh, you must also uh, uh, analyze the behavior of uh, the other to provide a balanced picture. So that is is very in, important. And a good example is a recent uh, Human Rights Watch report uh, that is reflecting on the use of banned landmines in the conflict in Ukraine by Ukrainian forces, but then also mentions both sides using banned weapons. And although in our Ukrainian colleagues have seen some pushback uh, about the findings by Ukrainian social media, it is also true that there has been an official statement by the Ukraine government that they would investigate such cases. So, um, and to me, what the example of amnesty show is that uh, humanitarian and human rights organizations uh, uh, one of the difficulties uh, that they have, it's an illustration of how difficult it is to uh, um, provide uh, balanced communication in a highly polarized environment as is a war environment. Um, but still, we believe that tracking uh, violations and the ability to present critical analysis uh, remains a fundamental prerequisite for human rights and humanitarian organizations to uh, do their job well and for government to protect the democratic space. Marta, maybe uh, because we are approaching uh, uh, the end of this really interesting conversation and you have touched upon this earlier on, um, I wanted to ask you maybe... Uh, about some best examples, emerging approaches to the protection of civilians in uh, conflicts. Uh, what can you single out as, uh, let's say, something to hope for uh, when it comes to all conflicts, really, of today? Um, well, there are some interesting practices, uh, the ongoing interesting practices that uh, are emerging, that are some hopeful uh, examples uh, and and they are drawn also from uh, the practice of, of civic of, of the organization I, I work for um, and I, I want to say that one of the key challenges to protecting civilians is the lack of trust that there is between governments and communities so addressing this uh, this lack of trust um, also gives us an understanding of where do we need to invest more uh, in terms of enhancing uh, protection outcomes, right? Uh, often there is mistrust that civilians have towards government uh, for perceived or real violence uh, in, against them. And as I mentioned earlier on, governments also assume that civilians are sympathizers or, or, or outright supporters of armed non-state groups. And this, what, in, what this means in practice is that civilians are often reluctant to um, go to uh, uh, security actors, you know, armed forces, to express uh, their uh, protection need. What we've seen uh, works is uh, continued training uh, of security forces on the protection of civilians. Very often in the conflict environments where we operate, it is a neglected part of the training of, of the militaries. Uh, often it's inexistent or it's a gap in government's policies uh, and guidelines. And this, uh, this training uh, uh, um, can yield results because at times the harm is unintentional and we can at the very least avoid that unintentional harm. And then we also um, uh, work with communities 
to help them understand what the protection threats are, but also the opportunities that they can exploit uh, to uh, plan against these threats. And when these communities uh, ask for help, we also put them in touch with uh, security agencies. And we've had some impressive outcomes. For example, uh, in Nigeria, we have a um, program that is funded by uh, the EU. Uh, and uh, we support it across the uh, uh, conflict-affected area of uh, the Borno state. And uh, we've seen civilians um, uh, advocate for and receive patrols from security forces that allow them to continue to farm, for example, and collect firewood. But also we've seen uh, civilians work with security forces to construct barriers that prevent fighters from uh, deploying um, improvised explosive devices in uh, villages, right? Uh, we've also seen um, communities being able to communicate cases of abuses uh, um, and um, that have been committed by either uh, government forces or by groups associated with these forces. And we have seen commanders taking disciplinary measures uh, by removing some of these uh, um, culprits, let's say, from from their posts or, or by launching investigations. Um, so as I said, uh, th there is this, uh, this uh, conversations and this uh, continuous changes that the the um, uh, civil, mil, civilian military dialogue and civilian military uh, spaces that need um, deepening, right? Uh, in Ukraine, too, we have adopted this community-based approach. The community-based approach means we look at what the needs uh, are, but also the harm that is likely to occur. We look at the self-protection measures that civilians put in place. And then we liaise with local administrative and security authorities and often create sort of seed mill um, committees, um, but also spaces where uh, administrative authorities institutionalize the relationship with civilians uh, that uh, didn't, uh, didn't exist bef beforehand. Um, so I think this is a um, promising uh, area of intervention uh, of course, uh, we continue to do work and we need to continue to do work also at the advocacy, documentation, uh, research level, uh, and then collaborate with other organizations that uh, are more um, fit for uh, the, the type of uh, human rights work, um, you know, that, uh, that relies on evidence gathering and collaboration with the justice sector. So... Um, I think this is, these are some of the things that, uh, that can be done and that for us we see make the real difference to the lives of civilians uh, uh, in concrete situations. Another example in the, in the, on this we have worked uh, in Nigeria with the support and the help of the UK government has been on the development of a um, simulation tool uh, where we uh, confront um, militaries uh, uh, and we um, sort of put them in a, in a position. It's a role play uh, tool that puts the military in the position of a, a woman, a uh, refugee that is escaping from combat and that, for example, needs to go through several uh, roadblocks. And um, I've played that game too, and it makes the, the, the militaries really understand the difficult choices uh, uh, that, uh, and situations that civilians experience, uh, for example, when they are confronted with extortion. And we have seen as a result that some of the trained forces uh, have, um, you know, avoided uh, such behavior. Thanks a lot for sharing this fascinating work that you in Civic are doing uh, to uh, uh, protect civilians uh, worldwide. And uh, I hope we'll continue this conversation in the near future. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.